Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere present and fillest all things, treasury of good things and giver of life, come and abide in us, cleanse us of all impurity, and save our souls, O Good One. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, in today's lesson, what I want to cover is the the commandments more specifically. So we've talked about practiki, physiki, theologiki. Now I want to talk about really the commandments, because that's where we're starting our catechesis. And I want to start first with just the name, the commandments. And that's not really probably the best way to think about them. So in Greek, these are not called the commandments. These are called the Decalogue, the Ten Logoi. And a logos is word. It's the Greek word for a word. But it's got a lot more going on. And I'll just start painting a picture of what a logos is. So logos is also where we get the word logic. A logos is a, an argument or a demonstration or, or the reasoning associated with an idea. It means word, but it doesn't mean like the sounds that come out of your mouth. It means a sign that, that means something. It's very tied in with the sense of meaning, um, reasoning, and order. Um, it's used in philosophy a lot of times to refer to sort of the, the inherent order of the universe, the fact that things are intelligible, the fact that you can understand things because they have a real meaning. It is also used in the Hebrew scriptures to describe the second hypostasis of God. We typically call him Christ or the Lord or Jesus or etc. Lots of different titles, but the word of God is one of his most often titles, uh, especially in the Old Covenant, but also this is how John begins his gospel. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. And so Deca Logos has a lot more going on with it than just 10 words. And I mean, very clearly you were like, there's more than 10 words. There's more than 10 words in the first one. But it, it's, a, it's a unit of meaning. And it's tied up with our understanding of how the entire cosmos works. Cosmos is another great Greek word uh, referring to all of everything as an ordered set or as an ordered reality. And, and I want to sit with that because these commandments were given not as a list of arbitrary rules. That's what the Hebrews had actually just come from. So the Ten Commandments are given to the Hebrews the first time right after the Exodus has happened. Moses has brought them out of slavery, out of a state where they had to follow the arbitrary rules of man. And they have been brought into a place where actually they're in a sense reward, although again, we've got to think about reward differently. It's really, it's, it's the fruits of good action. Um, the fruits of this good action of bringing them out of slavery, the fruits of that good action given by God to them is 10 more things they have to do? No. It's ten lori. It's ten words, ten glimpses into the way all of creation works. These are very, very tied in with the fundamental creation of the universe. This is one of the fruits, one of the rewards 
of being God's people is this knowledge. Now, remember, we just talked about Practici, Physici, Theologici. How does Evagrius, this early Christian mystic writer, how does he understand the journey of a soul from its creation to the end of human life? He understands it as a series of knowledge, a series of learning more. And remember that in Hebrew, this yada, yada, meaning to know, means intimacy. It means having this intimate connection, this relation to the thing. And so, again, Evagrius didn't make this up. He's just a really good articulator of it. And so he's the author we point back to. But this is a reality of the faith from the very foundation of God's revelation of himself to humanity is that he communicates with Lohi. He communicates himself through knowledge. Knowledge is communication of self with another person. And even think about the word communication. Com unication. With one. It, it, communication is to commune. It's to be, make one with the other. And so on Sinai, when the ten lohi are given, this is God communicating to the Hebrews, fisiki. This is the height of fisiki, the height of the depth of knowledge of the created world. And theologiki, where God reveals himself to them. And so if we look at Moses' life, so our Holy Father Gregory of Nyssa wrote The Life of Moses, which is kind of a, a mystical biography of Moses. And he talks about three really key moments where Moses encounters God. And the first one is in the burning bush. God reveals himself in light. And so Moses sees this bush and it's burning, but it's not consumed. And he says, that's weird. I should go check that out. And when he turns to the bush, that's when he hears the voice of the Lord. Moses, Moses, and then he, ha- he interacts with Christ. He interacts with the word of God, who in that part of the scriptures referred to as the angel of the Lord, or the messenger of the Lord. It's a common title that is often referring to the second person of the Trinity. He interacts with the word of the Lord. And it's in this bright light. He is given revelation. He is told the Lord's name. He is given a revelation and knowledge and insight. The next time that Moses has this deep encounter with God is during the Exodus, when God appears as a column of fire at night and a column of smoke at day. And Gregory of Nyssa notes that this is different. This is half fire, half smoke. This is half light and half darkness. And so as Moses is getting closer to God, God is becoming more mysterious The more that Moses learns about God, the more Moses realizes that he doesn't understand. He knows, but he doesn't understand. He has intimacy with God. And it's that intimacy that reveals how big God is. It's it's those of us who don't know God as well as Moses did, who think that we can understand God. Thinking that you can understand God is a sign of, that you do not know God. And then this third time, this third time that Moses encounters God, it's on the top of Mount Sinai, in the bright black cloud of unknowing. Darkness. In this most intimate moment between Moses and the Lord, when God reveals to Moses the ten lohi, God is darkness to Moses. Moses really sees God as the unknowable, the uncomprehendable. There is something truly other. And it's, it's in that 
that then this communication of God to Moses, we see the bothness. God is fully other, and yet he is closer to us than we are to ourselves. And it's this context that helps us understand what these Ten Commandments are. They are a revelation of God to his people, a revelation to the people of who they are. And it is a deepening of relationship with God. And it's the other from slavery. The slaver of Egypt, bending to the will of man, bending to arbitrary rules, bending to the desires of fallible humans, is other than the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are knowledge of reality and how it works. And it's, I always talk to one of my students, and we were talking about how, um, well, it's like if you're trying to learn a sport, you're trying to, or let's just say you're trying to play a sport. If I just handed a random person, I don't know, uh, 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 what's it? Oh, okay. If I handed someone a trochus, none of you know what a trochus is, and that's fine. But if I handed you one, and I handed you all the stuff you needed to play the game trochus, and I said go, you would not be capable of doing it. And the reason you wouldn't be able to be capable of doing trochus well is because you don't know what you're doing. You don't know enough. You're ignorant. And the word that becomes virtue, the word that we talk about with virtue, not virtus in Latin, but like areti, areti in Greek, means excellence. It means doing something well. And you're actually not capable of areti in trochus if you don't know how to play trochus. But if I tell you how, if I give you knowledge that actually enables arity. Knowing about reality actually enables virtue. Not knowing about reality actually hinders virtue. We'll talk about this later, but there's something about when you love something that requires you to know the thing that you love because when you love, you will the good of the other, and you can't will the good of the other, really, unless you know what the other is. You have to do it on that other thing's terms, not your own. And so when God gives the Hebrews the knowledge, what he's giving them is the ability to be good, the ability to be virtuous. They're able to live the way a human is supposed to live, they're able to live in right relationship with each other and with the rest of creation and with God because they're being given knowledge about each other, the rest of creation and God and themselves. And so that's the first thing about the Ten Commandments that I want to, to get us in that mindset when we read through these. These are not just ten rules. These are ten revelations of who we are, of what creation is, who each other are, and who God is. Another thing that's worth probably bringing up is the numbering of the commandments. There's 10 of them. Everyone agrees that there's 10 of them. Not everyone agrees on how to number them. And I just want to spend a minute on this. So you'll see two listings of the, of the 10 commandments. You'll see one that uh, gives, um, oh, do I, nah, I'll just tell you four commandments that refer to God and six that refer to people or three commandments that refer to God and seven that refer to people. And what that is, is the first commandment, I am the Lord your God, which again, already clearly not a command to just say, I am the Lord your God. There's more to it than that, but it starts with this revelation just a, it's just info about God. Uh, I am the Lord your God. Second commandment, no graven images. Now, in some listings, those two together are listed as one commandment. And then as you go through the list, the 10th commandment, do not cover your neighbor's wife, do not cover your neighbor's goods, 
those are then in the listings where they join the first two commandments together into the first commandment, they'll split the 10th one into the then ninth and 10th. Uh, and this is ancient. I mean, both lists are very ancient ways of understanding this. Different church fathers talk about both different lists. I forget who the writer is, but I read somewhere where they talked about actually one of the was is wonderful because understanding it as a list of three and then a list of seven is wonderful numbers already. Three to refer to God, which is proper because God is Trinity. And then seven to refer to the rest of humanity because this is a perfect law. And again, when we talk about law, that's from the Hebrew Torah, which has a lot more to do with this idea of education than just, you know, command. And that fits in with everything we've just been talking about. So three and seven make sense. On the other hand, four and six make sense because four is the number that refers to the four directions of the earth. It's kind of the completeness of creation. And so these commandments, these 10 are given so that once one has a proper relationship with all of creation, that's when you can have a right relationship with the creator, or even then to imply that actually right relationship with the creator is a right relationship with all of creation. And then six, six is an incomplete number. Seven is the number of completion, six is the incomplete number. This law isn't the end all be all. There's more to come. This is not a full revelation of God. The new covenant hasn't been given yet. And so both of these listings are, are praised by church fathers for their aptness. And then the last thing, um, the Ten Commandments are given twice by Moses. Once in Exodus, and then once way later in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, Moses is preaching to the children of those who saw the Ten Commandments being given. This is, this is at the end of the wandering in the desert. And he's giving them one last teaching, one last Torah, before they enter the promised land without him. And he reiterates to them the Ten Commandments. And he teaches them the blessings and the curses. Living in accordance with the Decalogue, with the Ten Logi, brings blessings. Living outside of them brings curses. At this point, 603 more commandments have been given. Um, and they are more commandment-y, but also they are also revelation. They are, a, they are a, a, a condescension down to the people to meet them where they're at in order to bring them up to the 10 commandments which were given earlier. But at this point, Moses is telling them, if you live in accordance with these, you will find blessing. And if you don't live in accordance with them, you find curse. Not like how in Egypt, if you disobeyed your master, you were beaten. And if you obeyed your master, you were not beaten. Um, reward feels like a strong word for what the Egyptians did. It's not like that, because these are arbitrary. This is not a God who is pure will, no reason. This is not a God who, for whom good is arbitrary. This is the creator of all the one who is the good by which all other good is measured. Living in accord with these commandments is good. It is a divine way of living. It's in accord with the very fabric of creation, which is a reflection of the creator. And so as we enter into learning about these 10 commandments, this is what I want you to think about. I don't want you to think about them as 10 rules. I want you to think about them as the revelation of God's very personness to his people and the revelation to us of ourselves and what we are like and what we are supposed to be like and how we are supposed to live. So that's what I've got. For this lesson. Next lesson, we'll jump into that first of the Decalogue, that first Logos that God has given us.